Support for Oregon Artbeat is provided by the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation Endowed Fund for Excellence, the Kinsman Foundation, Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, John and Patricia Beckman Fund, and the contributing members of OPB and viewers like you. Thank you. Well, 20 is next. Mark Rothko, orange, red, yellow. And $24 million starts. 24 million, 25 million, 26, 27 million, 28 million, 29 million, 30 million, 31 million, 32 million, 33 million. Going into the sale, we thought that we were going to have a very successful night. We had no way of knowing it would be as successful as it was. 45 million, 53 million, 56 million. Typically, for a high profile lot that we sell, you're looking at two to three minutes, would be sort of an average time frame. And for the Rothko, the bidding war lasted for seven minutes with over 50 bids made. 74 million. What's that? 75 million. 75 million. 77 million five. And selling to Brett Spitter, now warning, all done at 77 million 500,000. Brett Spitter at 77 million. Mark Rothko's orange, red, yellow sold with commissions for over $86 million, breaking all existing records for a contemporary work of art. Not only was this sale the world record for the artist, at the time, it was the most expensive post-war and contemporary artwork ever sold in the world. I think what this told us about Rothko is that he is, without question, one of the most important artists of the second half of the 20th century. Rothko's one of our great American artists. Rothko is deceptively simple and yet profound. There's nothing simple about Rothko's work. It's actually very complex. If you think it is simple, you should try to do it yourself. I think my father really communicated the seriousness of painting. The painting wasn't something just to look at. It wasn't something that you appreciated because it appealed to the senses, but because it had something more to tell you about your own life. I've known few people who have sat in front of Rothko for an hour, and it has really changed their life. Mark Rothko's work opened you up in ways that you're not expecting. I used to think that Rothko paintings were just these easy squares. And the longer I look at the Rothko paintings, the more I see these worlds, these kind of locations that he wants us to go to. And I like that, then it's open. You know, what is my experience going to be is gonna be different than what your experience is gonna be. And both of them are right. You can't stand in front of a, a large canvas and not have a sense of self. It just has that power. It's very unusual. He created something cohesively. A century later, it can expand into a language that we don't know that we need it. <laughs> This chaotic time that we live in, the angst, the anxiety, all of that is given a framework by Mark Rothko. Today is a great time, great context to revisit a Mark Rothko and, and sit in front of it for hours and hours. <laughs> Thank you.
My father was born in Dvinsk, which was then a part of the Russian Empire. Dvinsk was part of the Pale of Settlement, which was this wide swath of land where Jews were allowed to live. And anti-Semitism was rampant during this time. There was an incredible military presence in Dvinsk. His brother Moisey writes about the Cossacks running through town on horseback and whipping the townspeople, and Mark actually suggests that he has a scar on his nose that was caused by such a whip. My father's father and his two older brothers were conscripted into the Tsar's army, and they decided that they would rather flee than fight. It would have been very unlikely that they would have seen more than a couple of winters uh, in, the, in the army, so they decided to, to uh, emigrate to the U.S. Between 1880 and 1924, 2.5 million Jews came to the United States from Imperial Russia. Marcus Rothkowitz is part of that migration, arriving at Ellis Island in the summer of 1913. He won't change his name to Mark Rothko for another 25 years. He crosses the country by train, arriving in the distant land of Portland, Oregon, already home to a handful of Rothkowitz relatives. When Rothkowitz arrives to Portland in 1913, he arrives in a community in which he does not understand the language, the social structures, or the reason for being there. It's an event that shapes his being his entire life. That of the outsider, the stranger, and I think it's important in thinking about the Mark Rothko that we all know and have come to love it through his paintings as a first generation immigrant who struggles with the change of language, society, and class. Just a year after Rothko arrives, his father dies, leaving his mother with no income. He had to raise money for the family by selling newspapers. This was a, something that a lot of the immigrant kids did. And would come home beaten up because the other guys didn't want another corner taken up. Rothko also begins working in the shipping department of his uncle's downtown Portland shop, the New York Outfitting Company. Things sometimes got quiet, and Mark would doodle or draw on New York Outfitting wrapping paper. His uncle happened to come by one day and say, Mark, what are you doing? And Mark would show him. He says, uh-uh, you're not going to be able to earn a living that way. Rothko attends Lincoln High School in southwest Portland. He writes for the school paper, joins a debate team, and proves to be one of the school's top students. Mark Rothko graduated in three years from Lincoln High School. And there was an article in the Oregonian that noted that three young men had gotten full scholarships to go to Yale University from the graduating class of Lincoln High School. The scholarships are withdrawn the second year because Yale wasn't ready to have verbal, accomplished, politically inclined Jewish students in the middle of the bastion of WASP culture. The second year, he supports himself by working in a laundry downtown, and he works in a dining hall with all the swells. He gets through his second year and decides that he can't go on. And instead of coming home, he goes to New York. The art scene in New York in the 20s, it's unimaginably small. I think everybody knew everybody. And to study modern art in any sense, you really went to the Art Students League. It's a place where there were open studios and modeling sessions, and artists dropped in and connected got to know everybody on the scene. I don't think my father ever had contemplated being an artist. He went to college to study 
history and economics and mathematics. And he really stumbled upon it through a friend who invited him for a drawing class at the Art Students League. My father was always someone who had a lot to say, ideas in his mind that he wanted to communicate. And I think art was simply a very welcome vehicle for him to start expressing those ideas. Rothko begins studying with Milton Avery, a painter known for bringing a human element to his landscapes and portraits. I think that my father learns from Avery is that when you are making a painting, you want to get to the essences, you want to get to those expressive essentials. They're not interested in depicting accurately the scene around them. They're trying to get to what makes a human being and how you can express that through paint. There are hundreds of early figurative works by my father, both on canvas and on paper. And there are many, many different styles, many portraits, lots of nudes, landscapes, particularly a lot of cityscapes where he's trying to get inside the minds of the people who are living in this urban environment. His first paintings that we know of are from those early years. Not terribly promising. He doesn't seem to have a lot of facility right out of the gate. He sticks with it for some reason, and it's a long career with wonderful twists and turns until he becomes Rothko, until he finds himself, you could say. In the summer of 1933, at the height of the Great Depression, Rothko and his new wife, Edith Zacher, hitchhike across the country to visit Rothko's family in Portland. And where did they stay? Not with his mother. No, with his sister? No. They camped in the West Hills, somewhere in the West Hills, overlooking the Willamette to the east side. While they were up there, Mark painted the landscape. We saw an east side that had trees, and he gave these very sweet watercolor paintings to members of the family. My family thought he was a little crazy, <laughs> sleeping out on the hillside and hitchhiking across the country. Whenever they came, I would have a brunch. We had a deck outside of the house, and I'd gather all the family that I could. And it was just a nice, warm gathering. That's my father, Moise. This is Albert, and this is Mark. I felt very close to him, even though I didn't see him very often because he lived in New York. I used to write letters to him. My mother used to complain that he never sent home any money. <laughs> but he was a poor, starving artist. My father's brothers were far more practical than he was, and they uh, went on to pursue careers as pharmacists, which was the family, the family business for a few generations. And they were sometimes resentful that the youngest child went off and pursuing this crazy career as an artist when he had a mother to support. Part of the family used to make fun of his paintings. His eldest sister honestly said to him at that time, I don't understand a thing about your art. Mark, paint me a picture that I can understand. So, as a dutiful brother, he did paint her a picture that she could understand, a small picture. I think my father's family never quite understood this whole idea of being an artist, or certainly what his artwork was about, uh, and yet he remained very close to them. Uh, they were central to his life. Rothko's 1933 Portland trip included his first ever one-man show, at the Portland Art Museum. The Oregonian reviewed the exhibition and commented on the interest of his landscape and figurative work. The exhibition at the museum was an important show for Rothkowitz intellectually and spiritually. 
It was not financially a success, but then he had been struggling for almost a decade already in how to make a living as an artist. Back in New York, Rothko's style continues to evolve as he begins a series of paintings of the New York subway. There's some of his most psychological paintings, and although on one level you could say he's talking about the plight of the masses, I think much more he's looking at the individual who loses their individuality in the context of those masses. In Rothko's take on the subway, the pictures have a sense of the isolation. It's in a sense the first work he makes that's truly poignant. They are very moving and uh, disturbing images. Figures almost hiding between and behind the columns, very elongated, emaciated. There's a sense of maybe being in a catacomb. And you can see almost the geometric configurations that he's looking at and playing with that he will be doing in a purely abstract way 15 years later or so. It's always been remarkable to me that for the first 25 or 30 years of his career, my father created so much artwork, but it was all done nights and weekends because he had a day job as a teacher and he was selling essentially zero paintings. But at one point around 1940-41, he actually stopped painting for about a year to pursue his own philosophical ideas. But he comes out of that process re-energized and recommitted to painting and launches fully into his surrealist phase and I think really never looks back from there. What we do here at the National Gallery, we're caring for handmade objects that have ended up here in Washington, D.C. This incredibly rare treasured collection is, is ours to, to learn about, to study, and to take care of. The challenge of working with masterpieces is, is that they're irreplaceable. There's a lot of responsibility on the conservator, making right decisions, using the right materials. The picture I'm working on today is a late picture uh, for Rothko, late 1969. Picture sustained a few impact cracks from the reverse, so the canvas was flexed, and the slightly more brittle paint on the surface cracked. The cracks have slightly raised, and you can begin to see the white ground below this dark black paint. What I'm doing is just flowing the right black color into these cracks so that you don't see them anymore. The cracks just, I mean, they haven't physically closed, but you no longer see the white of the crack. Reversibility is a key tenet of modern conservation uh, with the idea being that everything we do can be safely undone. So if you apply retouching for a loss, you want that material to be very soluble 50 years from now if somebody ever needs to remove it. A lot of what we do is if you can get a picture to present well in the gallery so that your eye keeps moving across the surface and doesn't stop, you've accomplished a lot. You've probably accomplished all you need to do. Pretty much by the mid 40s, Rothko evolved a way of painting with very, very thin paint layers. He stretches cotton duck canvas and he seals it with rabbit skin glue, but he pigments the glue first. And then on top of that colored layer, then he'll work with very, very thin layers of oil paint, very thin layers of handmade paints where he's mixing pigment in Damar resin, or he's mixing pigment in eggs. If you look at any Rothko very carefully, you'll start to see variations in matte and gloss, 
variations in opacity, and these all have to do with how he changes media. I think the layering creates an aura about them. I think they entice us visually to enter them. The oil surface can almost push you away, the viewer, whereas these layers that incorporate different materials invite you in because some are shiny and some are not, and some are moving and some are not, and it's a, it's a much more engaging surface than something that's just flat. For me, the best thing about working on Rothko is having developed this connection over many, many years. Things I've worked on, things I've instructed fellows and interns on. He's a very special painter to me. At the dawn of the 1940s in New York, Rothko and fellow painter Adolf Gottlieb are seeking new, more direct ways to express their ideas on canvas. My father had always had an interest in Greek mythology, and it began to manifest itself in his paintings. They were trying to come up with a subject matter that would be original and that would not be indebted to European art and to Picasso. With World War II in full swing, I think lots of intellectuals were looking at ideas about tragedy, ideas about history, and trying to find answers. Whereas traditional American painting wanted to create the sense of depth, the space of the real world on the canvas, Rothko and Gottlieb abandoned that, and they, in very modern, contemporary voice, create a flat picture. He's very much drawing on surrealism in doing that, so ideas about the unconscious, fantasy, free association, creatures turning into other creatures. In 1943, Rothko and Gottlieb display their new work at a show by the Federation of Modern Painters and Sculptors. It's reviewed in the New York Times by Edward Jewell, a conservative art critic who pans the exhibition who finds in these fledgling modernists the immigrant voice, the non-American voice, and he's very critical. Rothko and Gottlieb write a letter to the New York Times, which has now gone down in history because it's really a manifesto, and it's not just a complaint. Times publishes the whole thing, and midway through, they articulate these five points. Number one, to us, art is an adventure into an unknown world which can be explored only by those willing to take the risks. Number two, the world of the imagination is fancy free and violently opposed to common sense. Three, it is our functions as artists to make the spectator see the world our way, not his way. Hmm. Number four, we are for flat forms because they destroy illusion and reveal truth. Number five. There is no such thing as good painting about nothing. We assert that the subject is crucial, which is tragic and timeless. Sincerely yours, Adolf Gottlieb and Marcus Rothko. It's wonderful. <laughs> I think it tells a lot about that particular time that it was written. It introduces language which will become the common language of art studios in New York. They were breaking away from a tradition. And in so doing, you almost have to destroy the tradition you're breaking away from. It makes perfect sense to me that they would feel the way they did because they were striking out doing something new and different. And they knew it, too. Within a few years, the new artistic movement called Abstract Expressionism begins to emerge in New York. Artists like Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and Clifford Still, along with Rothko and Gottlieb, are creating a new, uniquely American form of art. Before this time, American painters, they traveled to Europe, and they went home, and nobody really heard of them again. Right after World War II, all of that changes. Abstract Expressionists were interested in big ideas, big concepts based in human 
energy and human response, they launched into the abstraction. You're standing in front of a color, or standing in front of an abstract form, and standing in front of large paintings, I mean, very large paintings. I mean, it was just such a, a huge achievement or a challenge, excitement, to paint something that large. These painters are the talk of the world, and in some sense, the center of the art world shifts from Europe, from Paris in particular, to the U.S. and to New York. It's a huge moment that we're, we're still dealing with. By 1948, Rothko's work has moved into pure abstraction, creating a series of paintings that later become known as the multiforms. Rothko begins to question the compositional value of the figure. You see him minimizing it. He could not keep painting the figure without mutilating it, his, his word, interesting word. He seeks something deeper, something emotionally more resonant. There were a lot of ideas that he was playing out with the multiforms, and I feel a certain exuberance in a refined way. I mean, I don't think he was an exuberant person, but um, I, I feel a sense of excitement in them, that he, he was getting into something that was beginning to work. And though he still sells few paintings and struggles to find venues for his work, Mark Rothko is on the verge of a breakthrough. Everything that we care about in life, whether it be work, home, leisure, everything comes alive when we are more fully embodied in our senses. There's a technical term called Nihonga, which is Japanese style painting. A few of the paintings done on paper, stretched over canvas, starts with 80 to 100 layers of very thin mineral pigments just to get it started. And yes, I am directly quoting Rothko when I'm layering. I think he would love the material of Nihonga. It's using Japanese materials, silk, paper, sumi ink, but also pulverized minerals. So these are precious minerals that are pulverized by hand, prepared gold, silver, platinum. It is slow art and slow work, but I think part of the layering is to capture that sense of time in the layers. Mark Rothko, he not only painted in layers, but he thought in layers. It's very clear from his writings. He was able to integrate and even construct a way that color fields work and these layers work in very subtle ways that allow for a new world to open up. Just magical to me. That doesn't make sense, but that's what you experience. Mark Rothko painted the abyss, and he's inviting us to stand on that abyss. Now, you can say that is a despair-filled experience, but I think it's also an invitation to hope. I don't mean this sentimental feeling of hope. But I mean that it makes me want to go into my studio and paint. And that is my act of hope. <laughs> In 1949, Mark Rothko discovers the style that will define him for the rest of his life. 
he finds a format where he can make full and direct expression of the ideas he's wanted to express for so long. For me, the excitement in 49 to 50 are the way he celebrates the edge. As these color blocks come together and they begin to sit in relationship to each other, it is that gap between in which the magic begins to develop. There's a turning point in your life that you can just mark and say, this is when I found my voice, a voice that is a destination of everything that you've done in the past. And that is a fertile place for an artist. He was always in self-doubt mode, always struggled with his own internal voice. So when Rothko found his style, he settled in that place of belonging. It represented the penultimate expression of that thing that Rothko had looked for his entire life. He found a place to live and celebrate and a vehicle for his anguish. With Rothko's new style comes new success. My father and Pollock and de Kooning and Motherwell quickly become household names through articles in places like Life magazine. Suddenly these were the wunderkinds at age 50 of the art world. I think by the early 50s, he is selling paintings and he's having solo exhibitions. He moves uptown, get a bigger studio, starts to be in demand for projects, commissions. He's busy. In 1958, the Seagram Company has just completed their fashionable new building on Park Avenue. The building will include a new luxury restaurant, The Four Seasons. Architect Philip Johnson hires Mark Rothko to create a series of murals for the upscale restaurant. The Seagram Commission for my father was a landmark for him. The $35,000 that he was offered for this was far beyond anything he had received before. But it was also an announcement that he had really arrived in the art world not only being commissioned to make his own space, but for a public space and by a very important architect. Rothko labors for months on this series of murals, and as he works, his style once again evolves. The Seagram paintings, they're an artist experimenting with much less color. This is an enormous challenge for an artist to take on, an artist that's known primarily for color. He's doing something very different, and I think they must have been very hard for him. And all the while, he's not comfortable with the idea of making paintings to line a restaurant where fat cat capitalists and society ladies would be eating meals. But he keeps working. By the end of the commission, he goes and eats there with my mother in 1959, shortly after it opens, and he calls up Philip Johnson the next day and says that he has to withdraw. My father was nothing if not principled, and ultimately he cared more about the well-being of his artwork and the expressive message that he was trying to bring than the prestige of having the Seagram Commission and even the $35,000, which he sorely needed. He really cared about audience and context and presentation, and he wanted to reach a really wide audience on his own terms. And so those murals, which he had labored on for months and started again and rebuilt, just went into storage. They effectively were hidden. I think the Seagram mural process 
helped say something about Rothko as an individual. It comes back to his questioning, his politics, and his reality as an artist. The artist as underdog, as thorn in the side of society, as observer. And he found himself continuously in conflict over commercial relationships in selling his paintings. In 1964, my father was commissioned by the de Menil family of Houston to create what was then going to be a Catholic chapel on the University of St. Thomas campus in Houston. It must have been a huge compliment to him. Not only in this case was he given a space as he was at the Seagrams, here he had an opportunity for the space and the paintings to work together to take the works of art to another dimension. In order to paint the paintings, he rented what had been a carriage house on East 69th Street in New York City. He built an octagon shape in his studio so that he could sit in the middle of the room and see all of the walls and the panels as they evolve. I visited my father in his studio, the one that he had rented for the Rothko Chapel paintings, many times as a child. And although I never saw him paint, because he really did not like people to watch him paint, it was really a solitary journey for him. He set up long rolls of paper for me to paint on and was very encouraging. I was just thrilled to be in that space and spending time with him. I remember his warmth and his enthusiasm about me being there with him. The Rothko Chapel is very much dark paintings. Urban legend is that he painted these paintings because he was so depressed. They were a sign, an omen of his upcoming death. I don't think it was that at all. I look at it that it was the natural progression of where he was going. He had done so much with color. He was a master of color and its ability to affect the viewer. His next step was to take the challenge to eliminate it. Could he still make paintings? Could he still make works of art that had that effect? To enter into Rothko Chapel is to enter into a person's soul. It's kind of a Zen experience. To be surrounded by these works and feel your way into a painting rather than seeing them. You can directly go to the emotions, the feeling, and that's a contribution that I think very few artists have ever reached. The Rothko Chapel remains, I think, a very difficult space for me. It's one that I don't walk into uh, without thinking that I'm going to spend some time there. The chapel doesn't just invite, it really demands the viewer to spend time and think about the big questions. I like being in the chapel because I like the sense of being with self. And it's really a remarkable sensation to go in the chapel that's quiet and cool and to sit and to just look at these paintings and to see the daylight moving through it. They're not individual paintings. The work of art is the entire experience. It's the space, it's the light, it's the paintings. And it's a wonderful experience. I encourage everyone to do it.
Rothko finishes the chapel murals in 1967, and they go into storage. The chapel won't open until 1971. It was a moment at which he had completed the most important work of his life in his mind. And then in April 1968, he suffers a dissecting aortic aneurysm. It is one of the most serious things that can happen to you, short of a heart attack or stroke. And so he goes into a depression. It is the low point of his life. And for the next year and a half, he struggles. His doctor doesn't want him to work on canvas. Physically, he can't lift his arms over 40 degrees. And yet despite that, he is painting more actively during those last years than at any other time. He produces a last set of works on paper. Many of them are dark, some of them are quite bright, and some of them almost pastel shades on white backgrounds. He is finding a new place for his work to live in a new format, but he can't escape the depression that's being fed by his limitations of his life. The depression kept growing. On February 25th, 1970, he ends his life. He dies alone in his studio at 66. Rothko will never see the opening of the chapel. But he did have the experience of the mural in his studio, so he certainly had a sense of it, and he was very proud of it. He had his official portrait taken, standing with the Rothko Chapel paintings that he had completed in his studio. Obviously satisfied with them. Well, I'm very proud of the fact that he was my uncle. There's one particular photo I have of the two of us. It just shows how much love he has for people that he cares about. And I, I love that photo. Part of what he wanted was future generations to find his work so inspiring and challenging. And that impossibility of Mark Rothko uh, is a puzzle that I want to be part of to open up, not to solve but to open up to the next generation and beyond. Support for Oregon Artbeat is provided by the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation Endowed Fund for Excellence, the Kinsman Foundation, 
Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, John and Patricia Beckman Fund, and the contributing members of OPB and viewers like you. Thank you.